So Luke chapter 20, we'll read, and then we'll ask for God's help in understanding his word. So Luke 20, verse 19. The chief priests and the scribes, the same hour, sought to lay hands on him. They feared the people, for they perceived that he'd spoken this parable against them. They watched him and sent forth spies, which would feign themselves just men, that they might take hold of his words, so they might deliver him to the power and authority of the governor. And they asked him, saying, Master, we know that you say and teach rightly, neither accept the person of any, but teach the way of God truly. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or no? But he perceived their craftiness. He said to them, Why tempt ye me? Show me a penny. Whose image and superscription, superscription has it? They answered him and said, Caesar's. He said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and to God the things which are God's. They could not take hold of his words before the people, and they marveled at his answer and held their peace. All right, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, um, we desire to study your word this afternoon to rightly divide the word of truth. Father, teach us, teach us not just what this passage means, but teach us how to know the meaning of all passages of Scripture. Father, guide our, our thoughts, give us insight. Holy Spirit, uh, teach us Christ's Word and apply it to our lives. If we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, a couple of things that we want to do anytime we look at a text. Um, we need to understand some principles of interpretation that will make sure that we get this text correctly. The first thing that we want to understand is the way you interpret the Bible is within its historical context. In other words, what we want to know is what the original hearers of this book heard. And then we take what they heard, and then we apply it to our context today. So in doing this, that means we have to interpret the Bible within its context. So once again, Old or New Testament. New Testament. Old Testament tells us about the Savior to come. The New Tel Testament tells us of the new covenant we have in Jesus Christ. Gospels or writings? Gospels. What do the Gospels do? They tell us the Gospel. They tell us about the good news that is found in Jesus. Okay, which Gospel? Luke. And who was Luke? A doctor and a traveling companion of Paul. Okay, and who did he write the Gospel of Luke to? Theophilus, which means lover of God. So this could be an individual, or this could refer to anyone who wants to love God. And he wrote to tell us um, the order of events and tell us about what Christ did. Now, in the Gospel of Luke, we have several um, major sections. The first is the birth narrative that tells us about John the Baptist and Jesus' birth. Then you have the life of Jesus. Then you have the passion of Jesus, okay? The passion of Jesus meaning his suffering and death. Where are we at right now in Luke chapter 20? We're getting ready to go into the Passion. We're in the Passion week. Jesus has rode the donkey in, okay, in Luke 19. And what does he do when he rides the donkey in? He's declaring himself to be king. Okay, they are excited because here comes the king, because the king is going to overthrow the Romans. But where does he go after he rides the donkey? He goes straight into the temple. He cleanses the temple. Okay, we talked about cleansing the temple, because this is, this is going to come into handy here, okay? Why did the Pharisees get upset with him cleansing the temple? Money. Okay. Why were the common people glad that he cleansed the temple? Money. Okay. What is the question about in this text? Money. Okay. So this is not just a random text taken out. So we need to be very careful that we interpret this within this context. Because this, this passage of Scripture has been used to say a whole bunch of stuff outside of its context, okay? He's already shown them their love of money, okay? We, we've talked about money. So Jesus is then challenged on his authority, okay? And Jesus brings up John the Baptist. They don't say anything. Why? Because the leaders are scared of who? The common people. They're scared of the common people. This is going to be important, too, because this is the same. You, you, you got to get the background here. You have the leaders you have the common people, you have Jesus, you have the Romans, and everybody loves money except for Jesus, okay? That, that's the way it is. 
So from there, he tells a story. And the story was what we looked at last week about a vineyard. And the vineyard was, I don't know, Isaiah 5, the vineyard was, it was the nation of Israel. Okay, it was the nation of Israel. And who was the owner of the vineyard? God. And who was the ones who were over the vineyard? It was the Pharisees. Okay, the Pharisees did not want to give God what was due him. And so the, the, the messengers that were sent were the prophets, John the Baptist, who was rejected. Okay, and so what did the master, God, send to the vineyard, okay, the nation of Israel, in order to get what was done to him? He sent his son, that is Jesus. Okay, what did Jesus say was going to happen to the son that was sent to the vineyard? He was going to be killed, okay, which is, is very interesting. Now, if you remember, what was the response back in verse 16? What did, the, what did the leader say? He said, God forbid. Okay, because what was going to happen in response to them killing the master's son? He was going to take the vineyard away. So they said, no, you're not, that's not going to happen. Okay? Jesus then says, well, remember the, the story about the chief cornerstone? Y'all rejected me, but I am going to be the chief cornerstone. That context helps us understand the text that we're looking at today. So from several factors. One... Verse 19, we have the chief priests and scribes. Who are those? Well, those are the rulers over the vineyard. These are the ones that wouldn't answer questions about John the Baptist. These were the ones that rejected John the Baptist. These were the ones that were angry that Jesus cleansed the temple because that's their little cash cow, okay? The, 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 the money, the, the love of money there, okay? They want to get rid of Jesus. Well, what did Jesus just tell them that they were going to try to do? Cast him out and kill him, Okay. This is the, the, he knows what's going on. He knows what they're plotting. So they begin to plot to get rid of him. Why in verse 19 are they not just going to kill him right then and there? Because the people. Well, why do the people love Jesus? Well, because of money. Because Jesus got rid of the money changers, and so now they can worship God, and it doesn't cost them as much money. They can buy sacrifices at a better price. Okay, so if you're plotting and you see these people who are happy because they don't have to give you all their money to worship God, what is one of the greatest ways to now make them not happy with Jesus? Money, okay, to get Jesus to say something that's going to cost them money, all right? So if they, they can get Jesus to say something that will take money from the crowds, the crowds are going to turn on Jesus. But what if you can't come up with that? Maybe you can say something that Jesus will then tick off the Romans, who are another party, and maybe the Romans will take care of our problem and get rid of Jesus, and Jesus will become their problem, and we'll be the innocent bystanders who didn't do anything. And that Jesus is out, the arrangement between us and the people goes back to the normal. They, they want to get rid of him. They want to keep the people. They want to keep the vineyard. They want to keep the position for themselves. Okay? Notice in verse 19, they may be blind leading the blind, but they understood exactly the parable that Jesus spoke, didn't they? So they knew that Jesus said, y'all are going to kill me. And they also know that Jesus has declared himself to be the Son of God in the previous parable. So let me ask you this. Were the Pharisees ignorant when they tried to crucify Jesus? No. Okay. There is a level of ignorance that people can plead, and we'll get to this more when we look at the application later on. But a, a kind of side application here, Romans 1, we're not as ignorant as we like to think we are. We sin against far more knowledge than we claim that we have. Okay? So verse 20, what do they do? Okay, we're going to try to get rid of Jesus. So they go and they find people who are going to pretend to be righteous, holy people. And they're going to try to get him to say something so that in verse 20, they can hand him over to the Romans so the Romans will do their dirty work. Okay? They're plotting to get the Romans to do their dirty work. So verse 21, notice they come 
And they begin with what? They begin with flattery. They begin with master, rabbi. We know you're the greatest teacher ever. Okay? Which, by the way, if you're trying to get someone to stumble, what is one of the greatest ways to get someone to stumble? Pump up their ego. Okay? If you come and say, I'm going to try to catch you so I can get you murdered, people are going to be very careful with their words. But if you come and you go, hey, we're on the same team here. We love you. We're your fan club. They're hoping that Jesus will be loose with his words. Okay? Now, they say that, hey, you teach the word of God truthfully. Again, this is flattery. They don't actually believe this. These are not just men. These are not righteous men. They're trying to trick Jesus. What is their question in verse 22? Should we pay taxes? Okay, it's should we pay taxes, but they, ref- they frame should we pay taxes in several key ways. First, in relationship to the law. Is it a good Jewish thing to pay taxes? And then they frame it, taxes to who? Caesar. So what they're doing in their question is they are setting up, are you on the side of the Jews or are you on the side of the Romans? But they don't just say the side of the Jews, they make it, are you on God's side with the law? Because you're going to issue that God wants you to pay taxes, or God tells you don't pay taxes. They're trying to get him to declare on the authority of God's word this issue. Now, this is a brilliant move, okay? Forget all you know about Judaism and the Bible. How many of you like people who say that you personally have to pay more taxes? Nobody does, okay? Even Bernie Sanders takes tax deductions. He wants you to pay more taxes. He just doesn't want to pay more taxes, okay? The, the issue is when it comes to taxes, everybody loves the idea of free handouts from the government on someone else's dime. But if you were to go up to someone, an individual, and we're not talking the, 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 the political charade of, uh, I'm going to point out in front of all the poor people, I'm going to make Bill Gates pay more money in taxes, just try to get them to vote for me. But if you went up to every single individual and said, God wants you to give more money to the government, how well is that going to fly in any religion in any place? It's not going to fly very well. By the way, why are these people happy with Jesus? Because he got rid of the money changers so they could keep more money in their pocket. If Jesus then turns around and says, hey, you know what? I got rid of the money changers so you'd have more more money to give to the government. That's not going to fly very well. But let's just stop for a minute. Were the Romans good government to the Jews? No. Okay. Roman soldiers would murder Jews. Okay, just, just, just throwing this out there, by the way, just to give you some historical context. Okay, we know Herod killed babies to try to get rid of Jesus. Okay, that's the government that Jesus is going to have to advocate to pay taxes towards. Hey, I know that the government murdered your two-year-old, but God says you need to give him more money so more soldiers can be here to kill more two-year-olds. That you, you understand what they're trying to set him up for. Right? Let me give you an example, though, about how bad Herod was. Not only did he have some of his own family members killed, but Herod was such an evil ruler in Jerusalem that he knew that when he died, there would be celebration across the entirety of Judaism. Like they would literally be in the streets dancing and singing. So when this is how I mean, this is historical, historical reality. Herod, when he became sick and believed that he was dying, ordered the most popular Jews in Jerusalem to be thrown in prison and signed that they were to be executed the moment he died so that there would actually be no celebration when he died among the people he ruled over. That's the government we're talking about. 
How many of y'all have ever read what happened to Jerusalem in AD 70? Where they went in and slaughtered. How many of y'all have ever heard of Masada? Okay. Where the Jews committed suicide as opposed to facing what was going to happen from the Romans. That's the government that they're asking about. That's the Caesar that they're referencing. Okay. This is not, hey, do you want universal health care or do you want private pay? Like, no, no. This is, these are oppressors who murder you at will with no recourse whatsoever. And you are the one buying the swords for them to stab you in the back. That's the taxes, okay? So Jesus is put in a pretty big predicament. What is going to happen to Jesus if Jesus says, God's law says you don't have to pay taxes to Caesar. What do you think the government is going to do to Jesus? If they're going to kill two-year-old babies, if they're going to kill popular people so there's not a parade when you die, what do you think they're going to do to the someone who has the audacity to say you don't have to pay taxes to Caesar? It's a one-way death warrant. Like, and, and they're there. I mean, they, it, this is one of those where if everybody had cell phones, they, everybody would be recording. Like, okay, you know, we're going straight to the government with this one. Okay? It's a pretty big predicament. Okay? And, you, and you can see the context of everything, how all of these parties and everything builds to this answer. Okay? So what happens in verse 23? What is the first thing that happens? Jesus sees they aren't really looking for an answer. Let me ask you, if Jesus told these men that God says you need to pay your taxes, would they change their minds? No. They don't care what the answer is. This is a gotcha question that is either going to get Jesus killed or turn the masses against Jesus. Jesus perceives that, okay? So, what does Jesus do in verse 23? Hmm? He sees through it, and what does he do? He calls them out, right in front of everybody. Why are you tempting me? Why are you trying to catch me? You don't want an answer. The question that you're asking is, you don't really care what I have to say. If you're, you're going to do what you're going to do, you're not looking for an answer. You're not looking for a theological answer. You're just trying to catch me. By the way, this happens a lot in life. And I would also throw out there that this is not always done because of craftiness and deceit. Sometimes people ask questions and they're not actually looking for the answer. It's true. Okay. As, as a pastor, um, sometimes people will lose loved ones, and they'll come to me and go, you know, Pastor, why did God take this loved one from me? You know what? Even if I had the answer, it wouldn't help them. What they want to know is that God loves them. That's it. Okay. And so we, we need to be perceptive of this. We need to be perceptive of what's going on around us. Okay. Um, this also happens, by the way, um, pretty much any time a Christian is on the news. And unfortunately, the Christians that they choose to put on the news are not wise enough to see their craftiness and duplicity and end up answering the questions and end up bungling them and looking like fools. Um, there's actually books written on this issue um, as terms of why they ask particular Christians to be on shows, and that is because they want Christianity to look ridiculous. So they're not looking for the most gifted orator and the most uh, thoughtful answer. They're looking for someone that they can make all of Christians look bad. Okay? Which is something to remember as a Christian. If you are ever <laughs> interviewed by a news station, they're not looking for an answer. They're looking for a soundbite, and you might provide it for them. Okay? So be aware of what's going on. And by the way, this is not just news stations. This sometimes is atheist. This is sometimes people on Facebook, sometimes people on uh, social media, Twitter, etc. They're just trying to get a Christian to say something to look stupid so they can screenshot it and share it with everyone. 
don't be that Christian. Don't take the bait, okay? Uh, uh, please, like, you're not going to win friends and influence people on Facebook arguments, okay? Or uh, Twitter arguments, okay? Anyways, that's for free. So what does Jesus answer now? He says, okay, he calls them out. And then verse 24, what does he ask for? He asks for a penny, okay? This is just a common Roman coin. Um, in asking for this Roman coin, uh, it, it's been pointed out to me, and I think it's a very good insight, that Jesus was so poor that he had to borrow a penny for a sermon illustration, okay? The next time you think you're poor, okay, the next time you want to complain about money, um, you have it a whole lot better than Jesus did, okay? And then he asks a question. What is the question that he asks? Okay, whose picture is on this coin? Caesar's. Caesar's. And whose name is written on that coin? Caesar's, okay? And if you look at, um, uh, if we had the TVs hooked up, which we will hopefully in a couple of weeks, I would show you a picture of these coins. And you can see old ancient coins from Rome. Um, you can bring them up on your phone and there'll be a picture of Caesar and it'll be the particular whoever was in power at that time. They would mint coins with a picture of him and they put his name at the bottom of it or on the back of it. Um, that's just pretty common. You can look at um, our coins have, pres uh, you know, have presidents and other famous histor historical figures on them. They have superscriptions on them with the motto of the government and sometimes in God we trust or different things on there, different symbols. Um, it's pretty common with all currency. So Jesus asked about this. And they respond, whose picture is it? Caesar's, okay? So they don't really understand where he's going with this. They acknowledge this. Verse 25, when he says his answer, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, okay? What on earth is he saying there? Now, I'm not going to spend... <laughs> a lot of time on abolish the Fed and how our currency is worthless, okay? That's a whole nother ball game for a whole nother day. But anybody who understands basic economics understands that this coin has the value that the government gives to it. And that's it. The, gov the value that the people accept, the fact that people will accept this as a form or medium of exchange is all the value that it has. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but all currency only has the value assigned to it by people. That's just the reality. Okay. When we talk about this, Jesus is not here giving a blanket statement on the right of the government to tax people's earnings, wages, property, etc. Okay. This has been used, and there, there is in Romans 13 where it says that we are to give tribute to whom tribute is due. Okay. Romans 13 is a, a whole other ballgame. I'm not going to get into uh, taxation, income tax, all the other type of stuff, other than to say that there is in Scripture a responsibility for citizens to pay some sort of tax for a judicial system that punishes those who break the law. Okay? Beyond that, you're going to have a very hard time finding a case for taxation in Scripture. Okay? Um, you have a very hard time for that. Jesus is not giving a blanket political statement on taxes. That's not Jesus' point at all. Okay? Jesus is not answering their question on taxes purposefully because the question is not what they, the, the question they're asking, they're not looking for an answer. They're not looking for an answer. What Jesus then gets at, and the main point of this, is the part that we skip. Okay, we all know, render to Caesar what's Caesar's. And I'm sure that you've heard politicians say that, and you've heard other people say that. The point of this passage is not render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. The point of the passage is the next thing. What is the next thing he says? To God, what is God's? What does every human being bear? The image of God. And what superscription do we have? Mine. <laughs> we belong to Jesus. We belong to God. And the point that he is making here is that we can be so caught up in everything going on in our world that we do not give to God what belongs to God. 
and that is the entirety of our lives. Guys, we can get caught up in political discussions. We can get caught up in taxes, arguments about taxes. We can get caught up in all kinds of things. And what he's looking at these people is he's saying, guys, you all are caught up in money that Caesar can take from you anytime because Caesar's the one that gave it to you. And you're ignoring the one who gave you your life and can take it from you anytime he wants it. What was the previous parable? Who was the one that created the vineyard? God. And who is the one that can plow over the vineyard anytime he wants? God. Who is the one that issued the currency? Caesar. Who is the one that can take back what he issued? Caesar. You realize that, that our, go- our, our government regularly devalues our currency. Anytime they want to. Anytime they want to, they just print more money, raise the national debt, and there ain't nothing you can do about it. They are literally taking their money back as we speak. That's what inflation is. Inflation is the government taking their money back from you by devaluing it. That's what it is. Okay? And so we can get so caught up in, I've got to keep my money and the government can't take my money. The government's the one that gave you the money. It is. It's their paper that they printed. Now, obviously, we're the people and the government's other people, but you understand the point. Caesar issued the currency. Caesar can take the currency. And they are concerned about the currency that Caesar gives, not the life that God gives. God can give life anytime he wants, and anytime he wants, he can take it back. And what are they concerned with? Money. Were the people concerned about the worship of God in the temple, or were they worried about money? Were the Pharisees concerned about the worship of God in the temple, or were they concerned about money? Were these people who asked the question, were they concerned about the worship of God in the temple, or were they worried about money? Every single one of them is concerned about the love of money, not the love of God. Are these people here, Pharisees, the people, these these spies, Are any of them concerned about living their lives for the glory of God? Are all of them concerned about their position and their rights and their money and themselves? Who in this entire section, from Jesus riding in to where we are now in chapter 20, who in this entire section has been concerned with God? Jesus. That's it. Everyone else is arguing about money changers, and they're arguing about whether John the Baptist was from God or not. They are, they're worried about, oh, no, that you know, God may come and take our, our vineyard from us. But they will not give God what he is due. Remember, that's the whole point of the parable. The whole point of the vineyard was what? What was it that the master wanted from the vineyard? What did he want? He wanted the prophet. He wanted the fruit from the vineyard. What is it that God wants from our lives? Why were you created? To? What does he want us to do then with our lives? Glorify him. We want to bear fruit for his glory. Does anyone in this passage care about that other than Jesus? And what is it that Jesus points out? You care about something that was given you to by a government that the government can take at any point in time and not about the entire purpose for which you were created. And that is you bear the image and superscription of God and you're supposed to be living for his glory. Now, I don't know about you, but that is extremely convicting for me. It's very convicting for me as someone who who sees... um, the inflation and sees the insanity of the our government who sees the just just y'all i don't have to go into it all the corruption all of the the theft all of the ridiculousness of the taxation i see all of the problems in our government and you know what i can get caught up in something that never belonged to me to begin with and not living my purpose for glorifying god i'm convicted just looking at this text but What happens in verse 26? Hmm? 
Is there conviction? No. They're upset, not because they're not living for God's glory, but because they can't catch him. That's it. I mean, he nailed them to the wall, and it doesn't change. He, he exposed them spiritually. I mean, you talk about bringing somebody up on stage and pantsing them in front of the whole congregation. Like, he, he pants them in front of everybody. Like, you missed the whole point of everything. But they're amazed by his answer. But if you notice, they all keep their mouth shut. They do. Why would they keep their mouth shut? He's smarter than they are, yeah. But why would they keep their mouth shut? Well, let me ask you this question. Can you all think of a passage in Romans that talks about what the law of God does? What does it do? Romans chapter 3. What is the purpose of God's law? That every mouth may be stopped and the whole world guilty before God. When the law of God nails you to the wall, you only have one of two responses. You either repent or you harden your heart. If you notice with Jesus all the time, Jesus nails them to the wall. Do they ever respond? They never do. Why? Because they harden their hearts. Whenever the gospel goes forward, people's mouths will be shut. And they're either going to acknowledge their guilt and repent, or they are going to blind their eyes, harden their hearts, stick their fingers in their ears, which, by the way, that actually happens. You remember where they stick their fingers in their ears and they close their eyes when Stephen's preaching? Why? Because their hearts have already done that. They have already decided, I don't care what is true, I will not give God what is due. And you look at that and you go, my goodness, who's going to, like, what type of two-year-old sticks their fingers in their ears and close their eyes? No, 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 I can't hear you. Every human being who rejects the law of God. Okay? So, do you think we got the interpretation correct based upon the context? I think we're, we're, we're pretty well spot on. How can we know we got it correct? Well, what happens next? Well, the next thing is another group of leaders comes with another group of questions. Okay? Indicating that their hearts are hard, that they're not going to stop, until they kill Jesus, and Jesus has exposed what they are, and he has put them to where they can't answer it. So, interpretation is the first thing we want to get. From interpretation should go application. So what on earth does this mean for me today? Okay, let's start with the obvious. Are we supposed to live for money, or are we supposed to live for God? Live for God. Is the money ever ours to begin with? No. Okay? Forget your view on government. The Lord has given. The Lord has taken away. It was never yours to begin with. Nothing that you have ever belonged to you. Okay? That also includes your life. So we can conclude from this, don't live for money. Live for God's glory. Um, we can conclude from this, that if I am an image bearer of God, then I have a purpose in life. And what is that purpose? To glorify God, to give him the glory that he's due. I mean, that's very clearly the application that Jesus wants them to get. Okay? But what are some other applications that we can get from this text that would apply for our lives today? Exactly. 
there are going to be a lot of people that ask questions they don't answer to. I, I have run into this with um, a lot of people who reject Christianity. The reason they reject Christianity is normally not what they state. They hide behind questions that they think you can't answer because they don't really want to address the real reason within their heart. And we need to have the wisdom on this. Guys, this, this is something that we really, th there's a lot of young people that I know personally that were raised in church that walk away. And sometimes we think that we're going to reason them back into Christianity. There is something going on much deeper within their soul. And so when they begin to ask questions, I appreciated Mary Ann this morning. Did you notice in her testimony? She mentioned just very briefly about how she had all of these apologetic reasons for why she rejected Christianity that all melted when the gospel saved her. All of her outward reasons for rejecting Christianity disappeared when she came to faith in Christ. You know why? Because those aren't the reasons. Those aren't the reasons. So when people begin to ask the questions, the gotcha questions of Christianity, the gotcha questions of homosexuality, the gotcha questions of, you know, well, what about, a, you know, you, 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 we all know the gotcha questions. Well, how could God create a world in six days? And what about the scientific evidence? And we, we've all gotten the gotcha questions. You mean to tell me that you'd believe that a woman who's 10 years old who was raped should be forced to give birth? What type of God? Is, what about the Holocaust? What type of God would allow? That's never the reason. That is never the reason. And what happens is we spend so much time trying to answer their questions. I, I have an atheist friend of mine, and I've answered every question that she's ever asked. But I've gotten nowhere because there is a reason far deeper. And that's what we have to go to. We have to go to the reason that is really beneath the surface. So just remember that people are going to try to ask questions that they really don't want the answer to. Because even if you answer the question, they're not going to change their mind. What are some other applications? Obeying the government. Obeying the government. Okay. Um, I think that there is within this a level of you need to pay your taxes. Okay. Um, this is not a blanket statement on how a government should tax. But if I give you something and I ask for it back, like our currency is issued by our government. It's theirs. And there is a responsibility that we have to pay it back. This does not mean that we should not say that we should not have a biblical view of taxes and a um, using the political means to correct that. Um, but there is a sense in which our money is property of the United States government. And what you do is you pay your taxes. Okay. Yep. I think the beauty in, in this passage is that Jesus acknowledges the, um, the place that a government does have. But as you mentioned before, it doesn't flesh that out. Yeah. I think sometimes people use this passage as a means of saying, look, um, government can decide for themselves what belongs to them, but it's not yeah. spoken here. No. It, it is spoken elsewhere, but it's not spoken here. And, um, he doesn't. Um, he, he just acknowledges that they do have a place for something, but he doesn't define that. And, 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 it's a, and I think that's the beauty of his answer, because they want him to give an answer on taxes. They want him to give an answer that the taxes that the government imposes upon you are right. And the whole point of his answer was to not answer that question. He acknowledges that the government does have some role. He acknowledges that we have a role to play in our taxes. But he does not wade into the tax code of the current day and say, well, this one's right, this one's wrong, this is that, this is that, and the other. No, he goes to the heart of the issue, which is our relationship with God. 
Very good application. What are some other applications? God knows our hearts, and I would go a step further, is that God gives us the answer to the question we didn't ask. I don't know if you all have ever experienced that, but there are times when I am going through something difficult, and God keeps giving me an answer, and I'm like, that's not the answer I wanted. You know, I want to know about this over there. And then I realized, like, no, he, he told me what I needed to know. Um, and he told me that all along, so... Any other applications? I'll give you one. The world hates God. <laughs> and it does not matter how logically inconsistent that is. It doesn't matter how factually irrelevant all the truth is. They do not care about the truth. They do not want the truth. They want to keep what God has created for themselves. And this is why we as Christians need to preach the gospel. Okay? One of the things that we have bought into that is very dangerous is we have bought into a physical world only that me, we as human beings have the physical and mental capacity to do everything that God requires of us. And so when we see someone who is not a Christian, when we see someone who is selfish, when we see someone who is caught up in some type of sin, we can reason them out of it. You can't. People are dead in their sin, until God awakens them. What is the message that God uses to awaken dead sinners? It's the gospel. Okay. I don't know if you're aware of this, but every sin in your life is illogical and doesn't make sense. But you do it anyway. It's true. Every single person knows what food is bad for them, and they eat it anyway. Every single person knows that they need to exercise and they sit on the couch anyway. Everybody knows what poor posture does for your neck, and yet we still do this on the phone. We all, we all know the issue is not answers to questions. The issue is a regenerate heart. And when the heart is changed, that is when the life changes. These people, if Jesus had given them what they asked for, and Jesus had given them a detailed explanation of the role of the government, where the Roman government was right, where the Roman government was wrong, and told every single person their exact tax bill according to God's law, how many people would have accepted it? Zero. Because that's not the issue. The issue is the need for a regenerate heart. Anything else? Any other questions or comments on this passage? All right. Well, again, I hope you understand not just what this means, but I hope you understand how to understand the Bible. And I hope this helps you as you're reading to begin to look at texts and just say, hey, I don't have to have a lot of knowledge. I can just ask some, some cons consistent questions, read slowly, reread, read the context, kind of figure out what's going on, who the players are, and then you'll find that what you're reading will make a whole lot more sense and come to life.